Analytics are table stakes. They tell you if your game is a hit or a miss. So what do you need to know to continually deliver new features, updates, promotions, in-game events, improvements to your game? The list goes on and on. And how do you know when you are hitting it, when you need to dial your efforts up or down based on the metrics? Well, guess what? We're going to answer those questions tough as they are because we're going to do a deep dive literally into Dive. Dive is a game analytics platform and service that helps companies like GameFam maximize their LTV, understand player behavior, and we're going to get the inside track from its founder and CEO. He's an entrepreneur with a solid track record, uh, heading two successful companies in the online gaming and social casino space, and one of these was House of Fun. He's active as an angel investor, an advisor, a board member, working with startups for the last five years, and he has poured all that experience, that pure gold knowledge into Dive. Elad Levy, welcome to The Hive. We're going to talk about the dive on The Hive. How's that grab you? <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you very much, Peggy. Love the, love the intro. Now, you founded it based on firsthand experience in the industry. We talked about that. You've been out there and you sold a company to Playtica. Working on a top grossing uh, game um, studio is uh, an amazing experience. And having that front seat row is like a privilege. I think I developed and redeveloped and redeveloped the same tools over and over several times until I got it right. And we actually got acquired by Platica and Platica asked, look, we love your tools. Can you bring them to the rest of the game studios? But they were really tightly coupled into their, the game itself that it was very hard disconnecting. It's, it's actually happening in a lot of game studios that they develop tools that are tightly coupled into a specific game. And then they start growing and it's not that easy decoupling them out of uh, an existing game and moving them to other games because every game is just the dynamic is different and and i think that in a way this is how dive started we wanted to kind of uh, build a platform agnostic decoupled pla uh, tool and then be able to connect that tool to different platforms different games different genres and then over time, Dive became like just the clients just started asking for stuff, and we ended up developing the live ops dashboard. They asked for AV testing, we did that segmentation, and we just added more and more and more features to the platform and became what it is today. You talked about the live ops, the AV testing. What does it now cover? So, first of all, today we are running over 80 games with 50 million monthly active users, which is insane started like as a boutique business with the, that I bootstrap myself with the, with the CTO. And today we are, you know, 20 people and processing like 5 billion events every month of data. And it's, mm -hmm. it's insane. It's really, I, I don't even know how it got, sometimes I just woke up and I don't know how it got there. <laughs> but yeah, it started with data as the building blocks for everything. But then we started hooking up with, you know, marketing attributions and Google and Facebook and centralizing everything in one place and CRM and you know, email and push notification and web push. And then the live up start uh, part started for the calendar events of like uh, orchestrating game events. Because we came originally from building a game and a game studio, we know how the mindset of game developer works and what they need when it comes to data or live ops or marketing. So we can really identify with our clients and, and hit on that spot of what is required. And we got our first publisher carry first. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden we, you know, manage BI for like bigger and bigger and bigger companies and about a year ago, GameFam approached us, and that was a beautiful challenge because Roblox is kind of like a, this whole metaverse buzzword. Voldex appeared, and we launched with them a Minecraft game, and I think we're the only one doing Minecraft analytics out there, so that's really exciting as well. It's exciting that you can also grow with the market and go in these other directions as you are. Was that something you set out to do, Elad, or did it just like happen? 
I personally, in House of Fun, had like a third party analytics tool in the beginning when we started, like one of those cookie cutter SaaS dashboard. And we threw it like away after a year because we realized that when you start scaling, it's not useful because analysts need raw data and product managers need to manipulate that data and they need a lot of customization. So when we started Dive, we said, there's no way around it. I know, I know it sucks. I know it will be hard to scale, but we must accompany the platform and customize it for every client. It's just inevitable. Salesforce understand it. SAP understand it. You know, those are platforms that are being tailored for every business. I think that games, we understand it. And that's why we had this approach of customizing our platform for every client, every game, every game studio. And because we started this way, then if you throw at us a new platform or a new backend or a new bus or whatever, it's easy for us because the company is like, basically the company structure is half developers, half data people. <laughs> so we're accustomed to like, it's, it's, not, it's not that when you ask us for a feature, you need to wait now one year for it because we have huge backlog. Sometimes in like a couple of weeks, we already deliver it to production because we're we will rebuild with customization in mind from day one. You're all about leveling the playing field for game studios, you know, allowing them to compete with the major names without building an in-house data team. That's sort of it. That is correct. You're delivering a ton of valuable insights without a ton of tools. It's customized. It's a dashboard. Tell me a little bit about what you see, what you extract, what you really offer the games studios and how they can apply it. I mean, there are two things that we focus on data. One is insight and the other is action. When it comes to insight, it's about centralizing everything in one place. And that's the data warehouse that we build for every game, for every client. So marketing, crash reports, gameplay, game economy, inflation, retention, engagement, session length, revenue, everything like in one place. So insight is the first thing that we do. And obviously we start small. We start with the basic stuff, you know, the basic KPI that you wake up every morning and you want to see the BAU and retention and engagement and session length and play time and revenue, our PDAO, our poo -poo. That's like uh, the basic stuff. But then over time we start, you know, evolving that insight into LTV marketing prediction, stuff that usually is done in big companies. For us, so someone called us BI in your pocket team. Like kind of like bring, the, bring that enterprise BI to like smaller game studios. And it's a, it's a huge help. So that's the insight part that we really focus on. And the second part is the action. And the action is the term data-driven games is a very... It's something that, you know, they, they throw around very often, but I don't know if like lots of people really understand what it means. Uh, how to really take insight from that data and um, put it back into action. I'm not talking about pricing. A lot of people are obsessed about pricing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, let's say that you segment a portion of your players and you want to offer them specific content, for example, and then that content you want to a b test if it's working or not you cannot treat the same way someone who plays five hours a day and someone who plays five minutes a day so when you segment those players and you want to offer them different experiences this is something that has to be connected to to data the same custom approach that we tailor in our reporting for insight we do the same for the live ops part for the action part so it's fun you know <laughs> yeah we have like segmentation based on, I know one game is based on trophies. The other game is based on like uh, matchmaking and winning. And it goes on and on and on. You, that was our base assumption from day one. Everything in the games industry is an exception and must be treated as such. And therefore we have to like tailor it, that experience for every game and every game studio. And, and that's just the way we work in, in everything we had cases we had to like redevelop our entire sdk because a game studio had this really special build pipeline for their game and qa so we redeveloped the whole thing just for them and it's fine 
for us, it's fine. This is like normal stuff. <laughs> this is like that. Our day to day is like that. And it's always learning. It's always changing. And it's great that you can, that it is so flexible and customizable that you can move with that. And in prep, you told me something interesting and I made a note of it. I said, no, I got to ask him what he really means by this, because you said you deal with the ugly side of data. What is that? What did you mean by that? Let's say that there are two major players in, in a data team. One will be the engineers. They are the one that collect, centralize, normalize, clean all the ugly data. That's a lot of hard work. They are the ones that wake up at 2 a.m. on Sunday when something fails, when the database is too heavy. This is like the we call this is like the data engineering part, and I call it the ugly side of data because it's really a horrible day-to-day -day work. And then there is the analysts or the data scientists that take that data when it's clean and shiny and perfect for querying and, and testing and analyzing, and then they look for insight in that data. Mm -hmm. So this, the whole data engineering part is, is ugly because it's a lot of hard work, yeah. annoying, struggling you know, with databases late night that it, it doesn't matter what technology you have, it will always reach a point when you start scaling that it will start failing. It's, it's normal, it's part of the process. It's like any game company, you know, you have more traffic, you have more data, you have more everything and it starts failing. So yeah. that, that's when it, it starts getting ugly because if you made the wrong decision along the way of the way you build that infrastructure, then you're, you will pay for it. <laughs> And I hear you speaking from it's experience, nice. Harry Lad, for some reason. I hear yeah, it. I yeah, hear yeah it. of course I was. Like, so many <laughs> nights, so many nights waking up because the CEO wants to wake up in the morning and he wants to see a report and that report can never fail, but you have no idea how many times it fails, even in huge companies. That's what we do best. That the whole ugly part, this is what we do best. We, we developed our own monitoring system for controlling this whole thing. And we developed a ton of proprietary tools to control all the processes of collecting the data and aggregating it and normalizing it. I'd like to have a little bit of your perspective as an angel investor, a VC, and put yourself in those shoes. Where and how does this pay off for an early stage or VC-backed game studio? Where does it pay off? It pays off because they can focus on the game and get amazing insight mm -hmm like one of our clients, and he said, dude, you're basically offering BI as if it was Zynga for a fraction of the price, you know, and that, that's amazing. I'm like, I'm used to all the dashboards because I'm coming from like a top grossing game studio and you offer all that for, you know, with a fraction, with great support and everything, because we also, we create like a Slack or a Discord channel for every game and every game studio, which is insane. But we do that because it, there's a lot of back and forth with analysts or product managers. And to facilitate that, we, we do that kind of support, that kind of personalized support. I've interviewed a number of VCs and there's another angle to this. I'd love to have you weigh in on this because some would tell me, you know, when I see companies watching this, taking care of this, thinking about this, you know, how do I acquire more effectively? How do I find a way to get literally more value extracted out of the data with a company like yours? You know, it's thinking about that, thinking about the shortcuts, the workarounds, the ways to do this intelligently and effectively. And they love to see that. We ended up making intros sometimes to VCs because oh. At some point, I'm speaking with like managing partners and they say, hey, I mean, this is actually how I, I, we spoke with Pollen as well, because I mean, hey, you're on top of the data. You see everything. You see the gameplay. You see the marketing. You see the LTV. If there is like a good opportunity to invest, let us know. And we actually do that. So we do intros to VCs or to Poland for UA loans or stuff like that, because Sometimes I see the KPIs and I and I say, man, I would put my own money there. Because it's just like it's it's too good to be true, you know. Some game studios are like that. Yeah. And it takes time. It takes like sometimes a year, sometimes two years to polish KPIs. Live ops is something that comes in a later stage when you're operate when you start scaling. 
But in the beginning, the insight is important. Insight on the marketing, on the game economy, on the crashes, on the retention and engagement and stuff like that. But then once the company starts scaling, then this is where LTV has the most important weight. Mm -hmm. And this is where good live ops helps because if you segment them, you offer them good pricing, good content, you do good A-B testing, uh, you really like build enough in-game events to, to keep them engaged, then then this whole thing becomes a, a whole different game. And yes, we are therefore leveling the the field for those game studios to have a chance. We actually promote a lot of self-publishing but by game studios as well because I, I, I don't know, it's kind of a classic conservative approach, you can say, that I have. That they should self -publish Believing in or... things and... Yeah, I think so, because when, I mean, I think it's more accessible today or more possible these days than it used to be in the mm -hmm. past. You, you, you know, with a small investment, you can somehow start, get the ball rolling, hook up with Poland, for example, for the UA loans, and then the whole thing starts just like, you know, feeding itself and the cash flow just, starts growing by itself so we kind of like complete that part in the puzzle of you know the data part the live ops part helping to maximize ltv uh, and getting the right insight in the beginning what are some top tips to get the most out of what you offer what dive does and offers how do i get the most out of this because it sounds like a you know a fantastic service but you have to understand it to get the most out of it exactly Exactly. And this is why, I mean, the chemistry with early backed, uh, like early stage VC backed game studios is so good because the people there are ex top grossing game studios. The VCs usually invest in those kind of teams. So they know what they want. Mm -hmm. They know how to approach data. They know how to, the same way they know how to lead a vision for a product. They know how to communicate because data serves the product manager the same way tech serves the product managers when it develops a feature. So it's very important for us when we start engaging to have someone who drives the car because someone needs to ask those questions. Data, it's something, it's kind of like a, something we repeatedly say in the company. Data starts with questions. Out of the people that completed this mission, how many ended up converting? Out of the ones that we sent email to dormant users, how many, I know, logged into the game? There's always a question behind it. We actually in Platica used to work this way. We built a product spec document. And at the end of the document, we would write the question around the feature line. Because developing or deploying a feature without asking questions about that feature, whether it worked or not, is, is, is just wasting time. You don't, you cannot... You cannot look at, I know, DAU and ARPDAO and stuff like that. You can, obviously, but it's too generic to understand because you maybe launched a feature, but at the same time, the UA guy launched a new marketing campaign and everything gets skewed. You have to ask really specific questions about, we launched this bonus feature in the game, how many people used it? And out of the people that used it, did they repeatedly used it? And whether it, how did it affect them? And it's not only coming from data, it's also coming from reviews, whether it's store reviews or emails and customer support that they say, hey, that feature sucks. You know, data tells one type of story and the community s tells another type of story. And that tapping to that, into that community is critical. The questions are almost as important as the actions. But say someone's listening in, of right? Course. They're seeing our show, they're saying, hey, yeah. How do I make the biggest positive difference in my gaming company right now? Maybe something about how to frame those questions. So it's one thing, like if you want to, I don't know, you need to jump the revenue really, like really fast. So you can make some sort of like a limited time offer for the weekend or like some huge event. And it's another thing of doing something that is more deep in the game because the progression system shows that people churn in day 60. And when you start going deep into that, you find out that people reach, we call it an economy wall, 
Like in the progression system, they try to upgrade something or some item and they get frustrated and they just churn because they cannot do that. So that's kind of like advanced insight that you find out with, with good data and quality data over time. It's the same thing with, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a match three game, then then there will be like an economy wall somewhere because by the end of the game, they, that, those games rely heavily on human being making them, which is fine. That's what makes it so fun. And uh, we obviously make mistakes when we design game economy for a game. And we assume something that is based on playtime. We assume that over time, the, the player will get more skillful in the game and will be able to pass this level or that level. Sometimes we are wrong because some people are amazing after one hour of playing a game. And sometimes you would play like five hours and you will still stuck. And, and it happens. It's kind of a balance between the pleasure and frustration. Yeah. You know, it's too frustrating. Yeah. You delete it. It's too easy. You yeah. delete it. You, you have to create that balance that plays with your head <laughs> and it's really hard it's really hard and you need quality da data to to track it properly so we we do a lot of that stuff you know like game economy analysis and progression system analysis and and data will tell us that we don't want an easy win but it can't be too hard. And then there, of course, there are player behaviors and your data goes into that as well. You know, some people are very competitive or they love to, you know, they <laughs> love the thrill yeah. of this. You know, some people want a challenge. Some people are not the, the ones who love a challenge. Some... And the data, of course, will tell you that. And asking the right questions yeah. will also direct you. So I want to wrap it up with a couple of, of final rapid fire questions. Shifting to rapid fire questions. Here we go. Metaverse. What do you think of? What's a what's a must do? What's a no go? It's here to mm -hmm. stay. That's for sure. It's a new niche. I don't really treat it personally as like a revolution because anyone who played World of Warcraft. 20 years ago will tell you that was an amazing metaverse that was an amazing yeah. metaverse. you would socialize with people you would travel people would play for like they they stayed awake all night like 10 12 hours just meeting other people and connecting with them i think that eventually the dust will settle and we will be back to quality content because quality content is the is the thing that mm -hmm. wins most eye-watering opportunity on the horizon that gaming companies should know or pursue? I mean, there are actually a couple of things that we can speak about here. First of all, games in, let's say, call it the Roblox metaverse, because the Web3 metaverse is a different metaverse than the Roblox metaverse. Roblox metaverse, it's kind of a new, but not so new platform. So discovery is easy it's not saturated like mobile so you know marketing user acquisition is rather cheap it's easy to launch a game it's easy to develop a game and the marketing is rather cost effective so you can get uh, like traffic fast and scale really fast so that's really like a really nice market that many companies are tapping into i mean and then on the other hand, mobile, that will be, that will be fun. But mobile actually declined, I think, for the first time because people are, you know, trying other platforms. It's natural. Yeah. They're shifting to, I don't know, Web3, yeah. Roblox, Minecraft, other platforms, and even web, you know, and, and that's fine. And I think it will be nice because the ones that will, prevail in that industry, the quality games will enjoy great UA opportunities because, you know, when the big boys start getting out of platforms or invest less money in marketing, there's less com competition on the bidding. So UA goes down, like CPI goes down, <laughs> it's natural. So. And, and yours and Dive was one of the first uh, companies to provide game analytics for Roblox games as well, right? Correct. Yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Roblox is a is a beautiful challenge because there is no attribution. You're flying completely blind. You like all the marketing is done inside Roblox. 
there is no attribution. You cannot attribute the, the, the campaign. You cannot connect the user and the campaign. So we developed a lot of like workarounds to work around that and calculate the lifetime value in Roblox. And we reached the point that within like just a few days, we can predict the lifetime value of a player. And it, it's really easy to then refocus your marketing campaigns to, to make them um, the ROI positive. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you bring up the so topic of workaround. That's my last question for you, because here we are, you know, we are halfway through and more of 2022 and want to know what's up ahead. You know, where will game companies struggle? Where will they um, succeed? I'm a big uh, fan of quality content, and I think that they will prevail over any con any platform web, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, you build a quality game, you build quality content and people will follow. It's, and then if you re-engage with them with more content or follow, I mean, you release tomorrow a season of Breaking Bad and everyone will watch it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's because, because it was just, anyway, it was like a super cool, you know, <laughs> or like, you're like, really like, revive lost for another season like this is like stuff that you know the quality was just the quality is just great there's a good book there's a good quality people will follow it we have started a great conversation i'd love to continue it and actually offline i will Amazing. i will indeed because you have some insights here that are gold around motivation behavior and just applying data to up your game literally but how can our audience connect yeah. with you continue the conversation maybe follow you somewhere what's the best way Elad? yeah so uh, my linkedin is pretty easy to find elad levy and then my email is elad uh, e-l-a-d at dive dot games mm -hmm. i still do the demos to this day I, I really like, I, I, I love it. I, I enjoy it. I love speaking with, I, I sometimes find myself in GDC speaking with some garage in the game studio about data and I really enjoy it. It's coming from a different place, mm -hmm. like more of a passion and less of like, let's make more money, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, can, I can hear the it's passion. That's why, that's why, that's why I really appreciate it. You take time you told us you gave us a story i mean it's not just the top tips this is strategy here this was solid i want to thank you so much cool. for being on the show and sharing thank you peggy great questions i love your vibe and of course if you are you a marketer or someone like elad who helps gaming companies literally up their game, then hook up with me or Paul and VC on Twitter or LinkedIn, and we will set you up with a show of your own. So until then, take care. Stay up to date with our show schedule by signing up for alerts at pollen.vc. That's where you'll also find our suite of financial modeling tools to help you plan and manage your business growth.